thank you so much everyone for joining tonight. Um, I'm Jessica Reynolds from AA Experimental 13, which I teach with Lily Jenks and Judy Aljar. We're very excited about our studio visit tonight with Ads Minoliti from Argentina. And this visit is the third in our series of studio visits after our first visit with Cambridge-based Harold O'Fay, who explored identity in relation to race, objects and cities. And last week, we had our studio visit with London-based Tai Shani, who explored feminine subjectivity across an array of incredible references and projects. And following our evening this evening, we'll our studio visits will conclude mm -hmm. on the 27th of November with British multimedia artist Ed Fornielas. So um, these visits have been organized as part of the AA program in collaboration with Studio Visit, an online platform that facilitates studio visits with artists all around the world, both virtual and in person. The theme of the series is loosely based on the concept of performing identity, exploring the plasticity of the self and the other, challenging dominant narratives and stereotypes and mining underrepresented histories. So this theme chimes with our own research in Experimental 13 as well, where we're exploring the notion of unbuilding museums, challenging monolithic singular institutions and reinventing processes of creation, display, engagement and archiving. And we're interested in the studio visit format as an opportunity to learn about art from the source, get behind the scenes, um, interact live with the artist and understand their processes and the format's open to interpretation um, by the artist, but aims to be a sort of intimate encounter and uh, revealing current ideas and inspirations and gaining an oversight into their broader practice as well. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Ad Mililiti was born in 1980 in Argentina and lives and works in Buenos Aires. They studied at the Artistic Research Center of Buenos Aires. Ad is a painter who combines a pictorial language of geometric abstraction with the perspective of queer theory. They use this combination as a starting point for different installations that encompass art history, architecture, feminism, interior design, animalism and the internet. The use of graphic forms, colour, frames and contrasting aesthetics challenges the normative social hierarchies in art and the political sphere reinterpreting visual identities and post-human landscapes. So they've exhibited internationally, including the 58th Venice Biennale, um, South Bank Centre London, IQ Triennale in Japan, Gran Grandview Biennale, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art and Museum of Modern Art Buenos Aires. Um, and current and upcoming solo exhibitions include the Kunsthalle Lisbon and the Baltic, um, as well as others. And they're the co-founder of feminist art collective Pintoas. The name of the talk is Queer Deco. And um, afterwards, uh, we'll have questions and answers. So um, do raise your hand uh, if you want to speak or write your questions in the chat. Um, and um, Ad can say whether she's sort of happy to take questions during it as well, or whether it's more sort of presentation and then, um, and then questions afterwards. Um, and also if you are happy to keep your videos on, that's really nice so that we can feel um, closer together and we're, it seems like, feels like we're talking to each other um, if you can. So thanks again and over to you, Ad. Hi. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you everyone. Uh, welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> the reason why well, I start here because it's also the heart of my studio house because after many years I, I, I'm able now in the middle of the pandemic to put together my house and my, my practice. Um, so now I'm gonna make a, a little tour but I think it's a good chance also to talk about this traditional uh, design. Um, this house is one of what we call sausage house houses that is very traditional in Argentina, like a line of very long houses where all the bedrooms point or communicate with the patio. 
So basically, this the the last owner, what they did is to turn down all the walls. So it's a big hole that connects with the patio. And that's one of the things that I really like about this house because and I was very lucky to get because I think it also for me is this eraser, erasing of the concepts or the division on how people should live their lives you know, or how to categorize our activities. Now I'm gonna start with the tools. So this is the kitchen that is actually integrated with this big like rectangle. Then now well, that's a bathroom. And now I don't have big works because in, with the pandemic and not being able to work with other people, I was concentrated on the small formats. So if you go upstairs, then you have the bedroom and the terrace. So you can see my dogs over here. <laughs> So animals are very important too. And then, well, like you see everything goes to the patio and then like a sort of appendix, but I have my work. Um, I'm gonna show you some of what I was doing, like in small format. And you will see if like, it makes sense with my idea of collage of putting together things that don't come naturally together in like geometry, geometry and sex, or geometry and tenderness, or with characters. Like this one that I was trying to get that vintage illustration feeling, like, like a story for kids. Um, so I'm working in this canvas papers that I like very much. Um, these are painting, pencil, color pencil, and ink. Um, um, You let me know if it's too boring. <laughs> but a couple of drawings. Um, I was thinking about flowers that also are like animated with faces and like thinking of Alice in Wonderland or a lot of Disney characters. Uh, I will show you that's a lot of cartoons are big references for me. Um, also, like childhood aesthetics becoming more and more relevant to my work. So, I'm also interested of like painting being subjects of characters in terms of the geometry being something that can take place like in the human activity. Uh, I'm, doing some experiments of thinking at how will a painting join tea, for example, of like hang out with other paintings. And so humor is very important also for my work. And well, now I'm gonna show you more, but basically this is my studio now, um, my house. Um, and I have to say, I'm very lucky also because I think it's an exception to my generation that is going through a, a house crisis here in Argentina. Uh, I think like the rest of the world, but I'm very, very lucky, I, I must say. Um, so. With that, I think yeah. I don't know if someone wants to see something else, but if you want, I can 
proceed with the showing previous works and projects. Could I ask about um, the the sort of images you've just shown us? Were they for a particular project, or they were um, just sort of uh, just things you you wanted to do yourself? I was just wondering um, if they're kind of part of an upcoming show. Or the well, now uh, I have two the two projects for next year that are the Baltic exhibition and another show in France. Yeah. Those are going to be huge. So these these works are more like small kind of sketches to put down some ideas to take them like in, in bigger scales or bigger size in, to these big <laughs> spaces. Uh, but I, I think it's part of also thinking through drawing and there is something that I always do like even though if it's like small <laughs> you know very quick drawing like I think I need the practice to think so I, I think that's like it's it's very important actually in in the way I work because it's a couple of concepts that I develop with some projects that relate art and education in a way that I truly believe that even though I'm very rational, like we have to learn and or process data with the entire body. And it's very important for me how to learn with my hands or how to think with, with my hands. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I think it's an ongoing practice, like, and yes, these ones are not in particular for some projects, but should I continue or cool? Cool, so I'm gonna share the screen. Um, so Queer Deco, like wh why I name this talk like that. Um, basically, Queer Deco started, it's a series of work that started in, in 2011, and it's an ongoing series where I use image from decoration magazines from 60s, 70s, and um, basically what I do is intervene with Photoshop. I put this abstract geometrical characters. Uh, like my goal is to replace the human figures with these other users. Um, the experiment is to try to replace the, the human user by also changing the, the design in terms of rethinking in what universe or if there is an, an alternative fantasy where I never know if post-human is the best description, but an alternative universe, yeah, where the human body doesn't have all the pre-charge that we have in Western society, you know, um, all the categories and gender roles and more. So I work with a lot of references to cartoons, to monsters. And again, this, I, I want it to be like funny. And, and I like very much like decoration from the seventies and eighties, because I think after that, like everything that is interior design also went very plain and very similar. And I like when design was more bold and, and like using colors basically. Uh, I like to mix like different aesthetics. Uh, like maybe the decoration is more early 
or late seventies, but then I I tried the characters to relate from different decades. So I like to think that with this collage also break the timeline in this evolution of design. Mm. They're basically experiments, of course. So some of the pictures, I take them from internet, um, but in this series in a specific, I use the case study houses because I was interested also in how this project that looked to design and build in expensive and efficient models in United States, like also end up having like very expensive fetish <laughs> constructions, you know, in California. And the way all these dream houses were portrayed was also very in, like branded in an heteronormative relationship. Like you will see in most decoration magazine, the woman being like the, uh, like an, uh, yeah, an accessory, you know, to sell something. So um, this is the best example on how I want to replace that hetero relationship in the way the ideal house is portrayed, you know, for our modern society and well, replacing the, the couple. Um, two books that were really important to think this series and also I highly recommend Pornotopia by Paul V. Preciado and Silvia Federici is so a great, yeah, a great way to rethink with a feminist perspective and critical thinking, you know, on how spaces are like disciplined or how the identity of the places also make like a performative you know division between roles and mostly based on this binary another anti-reference was this uh, new female encyclopedia that's how i started the series actually because i was doing this residency in mexico and i was thinking about sensor pieces as a way to think like 3D paintings, you know, and how like a domestic hobby, uh, it's also like a, a creative action. Um, also with the idea of erasing this high art and, you know, craft, craftsmen. And then I found these books in the streets of Mexico um, in 2011, uh, but this encyclopedia that is from 1979, that it was sell like now, <laughs> um, is still a reference for many families. And one of my friends told me that, that her mother like had those books, you know, so. Even though it is something that looks very old, it really affects the way we are raised. And another concept that at the time has a lot to do with this project was the ideas on usership developed by Stephen Wright. And if you Google, you can find that writing towards a lexicon of usership online and for free to download. I think it's very interesting. Um, well, the image on the left 
it's another work again mixing this geometrical compositions with tenderness uh, with furries and teddy bears that instead of having the work on the wall like how the performance of the painting changed by being hugged by a teddy bear so all my works try to be experiment or kind of questions on the speculation of what happened if I do like certain move or something is like twisted from the traditional way we see image, right? Or we interact with the painting. So going back to the Guido Deco series, I intervene also these two works by Joe Colombo. So first one is Visiona, one Bayer that I what I like from futuristic, retrofuturistic design is how I also get to all those ideas through the Jetsons or through cartoons or sci-fi, you know, how actually all these architects and designers shape the way we fantasize about our own present, you know, or what is modern or not. But then the idea, the very strong ideas they have on how we should live, you know, based on scientific method, like from Taylorism, you know, or thinking the Frankfurt kitchen to this unit that for me is basically a fetish what they do and how we consume all these fantasies. Um, again, thinking on how we see paintings and how to redefine the, the white cube. You know, I started at the beginning painting the, the walls with colors and then I give them shapes to these wall colors and mixing this shape of the brick of the cell with the rounded corners and giving them like animal cuteness. So this is a format that I use a lot. Um, it's kind of a, a model that allowed me to make variations and uh, here, this one was the work in, in Venice. So I'm going to show more of the ferries later too. So the idea of this cell, I, I take it from also the, the retrofuturism. Um, here is the example, the house of 1961 that was made in plastic. or the future house and in this idea how you can have all these molds, all these pots and, and cells. That's where the shape come from. Um, for me, using that model, but with this cute face or a cute animal, as a way to criticize how all these designers also demean like tenderness or cuteness, you know, as a value that was not too serious or important in our daily life. But I think it's all it's all the opposite. Like this one is an installation at the front journal in Cleveland. The idea of containing also each of the works with a mural is looking for to give like a room, you know, a room of their own for each of the prints. I don't know if anyone wants to make 
some comments or questions or we left everything for the end? I don't know. I think people can raise their hands if they have questions, um, but probably they'll sort of think have questions at the end for sure. Um, mm. Mostly because I don't know if I'm being too boring or or it makes sense with everything I'm saying. Oh. No, it's great. Keep going. Oh. It's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in this idea of rethinking the white cube and to give another identity to the projects and um, how painting also is consumed or produced, uh, I was very lucky in 2018 to be invited by Cadiz to propose a project. They wanted to make something that engaged more with the local community. So I proposed them to make a school of painting. Um, well, the project started there as the feminist school of painting, and then I have another editions. But for me, it was very important because this project was started like kind of side specific on it on one side because of the interest that the the Cadiz has the organization wants and that I also I want you know to connect more with with the people in the city like San Francisco that I never been there before but I really, I truly wanted to learn from the city and all the mostly like queer history from the LGBTQIA community. Um, also, because I always had this fantasy of study in the United States when I was younger, but then getting old, I start to listen all these stories about education there. And I was like, oh, I'm so lucky. <laughs> I was poor enough to not study there, <laughs> you know, in terms of how art is conceived as competition and not collaboration by many institutions. Um, but I think it's a recipe for failure. Like there's no way you can become a great artist or a, a happy person by thinking that art should be competition or ruled by the market. But then I also wanted to make this project thinking on how San Francisco went through all this gentrification that makes it possible for many people to access like simple classes like outside the, the big schools, you know. Like if you want to do some painting, but yeah, how we have a lot of alternative for education in Buenos Aires because the institutions are not like these big monsters, <laughs> like like it's in in the states. And I think that really helped me to think outside the box in terms of. Like I'm gonna show you later, like my bigger teacher, but coming back to the installation, the idea of the feminist call is that I transform the place with murals. We have tables, materials, and then uh, this is the, the website, if you go to this address, you can see all the classes and we have all documented. So basically, the installation was activated every Saturday and the classes were like a first hour of talks and presentations where a collaborator was invited. Uh, this person could be artists, activists, or academic, and they give a talk. We have a, a break in the middle and the second part of the workshop is painted, painting inspired by the talk. So basically also each class was 
based on a pictorial genre like portrait, landscape, uh, anatomy, or historical painting, but then everything from a very experimental and queer feminist point of view. Um, it was really, I, I enjoy it very much. Um, one of the ideas, well, here's another picture of, one of the ideas was to break with this etheria, no, ages division of education where you have, you know, from kindergarten to the university, like you have all this evolution that becomes cruel and cruel you now with different stage. And I wanted to return to the, this first stage of the kindergarten where this, the place is a safe place, it's a safe uh, space where you learn by playing, you learn uh, being take care of of yourself. Um, I think that's something that university in general you should do, you know, like be in safe space. Um, so all the installations are the, in this work also have like characters or plain colors. Um, different tables for different sides of bodies. Um, in this breaking with the division by age, it was very important to me that the school is open to all ages, all backgrounds, that you don't need to be classified in order to get access to education, basically. And at the end of each classes, people have the option to leave the, their works you know, for the window exposure or just take them with them, take it with you. And uh, I think this is Diana Eisenberg and I want to show her because She's my teacher uh, for many years, like outside the art school, like here in Buenos Aires, I studied with her. And this is her at her house and also the classroom because she has the art clinics run in her house. Um, you can learn, sadly there is no English edition but you can learn about her method with this book, notes for the learning of art. So Diana Eisenberg, like, I think also represents a lot of this alternative education that goes beyond institution, that is based in group work where really everyone's mind is working towards the development of each of the participants. Um, that I think it's something that the institution, the official doesn't take. Like you have a, of these human resources that you cannot work together, you know, instead of looking for like individual progress, like it's up to you only. Right? Um, this one was the art school in Buenos Aires. So the second edition was in the Museum of Modern Art here in the city. Um, when the school, it, when the installation is not activated, you have um, the TV playing like a YouTube list I made with a lot of talks like from symposiums, conferences, but also from YouTubers and everything that you can find on YouTube that I also use, use to listen while I'm painting. So the whole idea come 
from also the way I work that I'm trying to get uh, knowledge while using my hands. Uh, so this one is the furry that was also in the exhibition. When I start using the furries, um, for me, it was this perfect, like, guess to the shows that kind of break the traditional dynamic between the spectator, the public, and then you have like another entity that is between your human body or shapes and this other fantasy that is around the, the gallery. Right? Um, and it also fits me perfect that the fairy has all this fandom community, all this history related to queer history, but also to tenderness. Um, so this school was in this big, not retrospective, but big show that we call Museo Peluche. Uh, I can show later if we have time. So peluche means plushy, soft. Also like the texture of the furry. Um, the second project I, I did in 2018 with the Feminine School of Painting was this project in Mexico that the curator called a collective model for an affected institution, where the Casa Salasiqueiros, this very uh, iconic place in Mexico, invited me to intervene the farcade of the building, like here. So Cicados was uh, is a very famous Mexican muralist with Diego Rivera and the other one, and it's kind of iconic for political art, Latin American art. Um, what I find in Mexico in in some opinions that I have this idea from that time of art history that geometry and abstraction is for the bourgeois, it's, a, it's not something that could be a tool for political thinking. And for me, it was very important to plant this green big triangle because it's, it is a political act now in Latin America because the green triangle basically represents the fight for legal abortion and reproductive rights. Uh, it started in Argentina, but now it's being used for more countries, even in Mexico. And also, even though my works didn't look like site specific, this one was, this design was very in, in direct relationship with the history of the house, not only because of the Mexican muralists that used to own the house, but also because the same building had previously a project by Carlos Mota that was a pink triangle. Uh, the project was the shape of freedom or the shape of liberty. Uh, that with the intervention, they have like a newspaper relating the pink triangle. Uh, how was iconic in from being used by Nazis, you know, to mark gay people, but also being used uh, in the fight for AIDS recognition in the 80s, you know, with silence is dead. Um, so I, I thought it was a great dialogue to have these two triangles <clears throat> and keep adding layers of meaning to geometrical shapes and colors. So here is an example of the green triangle 
in a protest here in Buenos Aires. Um, the shape of the triangle is because it's sort of a scarf that also Madres de Plaza de Mayo used in the color of white, you know, to protest or claim for their missing child by the dictatorship. Um, so for them, the white scarf in the head represents also the the diapers <laughs> somehow from this those children's like the young people that was abducted by military dictatorship like in here in Argentina. So the green triangle pay homage to those mothers, but also claiming for legal abortion. Um, And the curator was like, okay, you can intervene in the FARC, but also if you want, you can take more places of the building. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I want to like, kind of infect everything with green. And these two walls were already there in a sort of gift shop. They have like showing materials from cicadas, like books and some studies. But then I took over the place and invite local creators like women artists, designers, photographers, like a sort of open call uh, to people to sell their stuff. Uh, not like in an art gallery, but more like in a gift shop. Uh, and it was very interesting because the the sala, the, the institution didn't take a percent. So all the sales were direct to the artists or the creators involved. And it actually created like a, I like to think a feminist economy where by using the, the farcade and take advantage of the building and the history, we create a lot of funding for the people that participate. Um, you can see we have like publications, ceramics, clothes, bags, um, but also like small paintings, photographs, drawings. And for example, I, I love it, this little cats made of socks that a group of women like remade you know to get funding for rescue cats um, so the building has also this patio with all the murals and i took over also the cover patio to make talks and other activities. And here is Ana Gallardo uh, talking about her practice. We have classes, presentations. This one was a collective press in using the gift shop for an open radio. Uh, press that activate also female representation in our history. Um, and for me, it was also important this contrast between the, the colors and this thinking of political representation, right, in, in terms of aesthetics. So again, this sort of collage between things that don't come naturally together. In, in, in institutions, in this used to be the space in, in the original house, like a living room. So we put two tables uh, with breathing material. So one of the table had material like independent publications and fanzines from the group Auto Editoras. The, that's a group in Mexico making a collection of all these alternative fanzines uh, and, and publications on feminist and, and queer activism. 
Um, this other one was with my private, <laughs> my own collection of this type. I think it was very interesting, you know, like an alternative library. So you don't have the official books, but you have a lot of data that is not mainstream or it's not what you can find in the newspaper or in the women's magazines, you know. Um, And the people, yeah, that was running like the guided visits, and they also have programs with single moms visiting the, the museum. And they they told me like they were really happy like to connect like an audience that maybe is not going to the anarchist meeting, you know, in the square to find this kind of material printed in photocopies but actually they kind of need that information that can go from feminist resources to how to survive <laughs> patriarchy or things like that. Um, but also mixing of publics with contents that is not related by age, for example, because the fanzines of this type of publication is more consumed by young people who So the design of the tables. And I think since this project, I, I also in Museo Peluche, I, I try to make like these reading spots where you can find like a lot of material that is not directly portrayed in my work but it definitely feeds all, all the concepts behind my ideology. So, so the second project, the third project in, in that same year took the format of a symposium. So I was invited by Art Basel Cities to make an activity or a project in this Victoria Campus house. So like Sala Siqueiros that used to belong to the Mexican muralists and had this modern architecture from the 60s. Victoria Campos house is the first rational modern house in, in Buenos Aires. And it's very iconic. Um, so I think even though I was very avant-garde for the time, I, I think it's like another white cube <laughs> at the end. And I took over the place with a lot of color. And also because it's an historical place, I wasn't able to paint on the walls or put nails. So I make this sort of stage with all canvases. This is print, but I also was able to get all these poofs and cubes you know, to give, to fight this rationalist aesthetic, because emotions and, and tenderness, I think it's very rational too. It's very serious matter. So, the symposium was called a symposium of expanded painted and speculative fiction and invited six or seven collaborators in to talk a very different presentations about their practices, but also as a way to kind of give a lot of information that was not explicitly related. Uh, related. Um, so a symposium that was actually very, uh, with a lot of confusion, maybe like, but the idea was that you have a lot of information and then you make your own connections if you want. 
So the symposium was like six or seven hours on a rope. <laughs> like, I, I want it felt more like a performance. Can I ask a question? Because I was yes. thinking about this um, with the previous work, and I was wondering, were some of those um, zines, were some of those things that you have written yourself? I couldn't tell. Some are yours and some are from other people. Right. Um, no, the, the scenes there were all from other people. Like, mm -hmm. I, I made scenes in, the, uh, scenes in the past, but in that opportunity, I, I took from my own collection from other people's mm -hmm. scenes. Because I was wondering how important, I mean, I was wondering partly if you, if you do much writing now and how there's such an interesting juxtaposition, but as you were saying, between this like very political uh, viewpoint and ambition and the fun, humorous, cozy, cute, you know, it subverts that in some ways, serious and and very ambitious, mm -hmm. like goals and, and uh, passions. But I wondered how important it is. It seems like it's not important, like you don't want to be didactic with it, right? So you're not trying right. to, well, you're trying to like open a space in which this discourse happens. Yeah. Without any, without dictating what the outcome of it will be in a very yeah open way. But it definitely, I don't have one didactic or one method. I just want to offer as much information as possible and in a comfort, comfortable and safe space. So you have the material if you just hang out there and you get the chair and just read by yourself. Or you can go to the talks and, you know, have this uh, presentation uh, or more like collective group or I try to have different if it's possible you know, but to have these different uh, moments in the same installation that can be activated or not also by the public by themselves because another thing that I do with the feminist school of painting is that the tables have coloring books like the designs I show first. Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, and the, you can take some stuff to, huh. to go. Mm. Or you can access the classes by video at the website. Uh, that's very important for me if I get to document everything so it's online and you can see it from your house and also recreate the class. Um, with the symposium, it was more like a performance because it was a lot of info. I think I, me and a couple of people were the only ones <laughs> through the seven hours. And it was like a marathon. You know? And I think that also activates another part of the brain you know, when you're like on full mode like go in alternative uses of the brain. Um, yeah, it, it's more like how to experiment with the same performance of the format of learning. Um, and this one was more of the creations around the, the, the building of Victoria Campo. Like, it's kind of represent, you know, again, the green triangle with the feminist queer fight and then the alien silhouette and kind of reflecting on my speculative science fiction side and then the paw of a cat, like the animal dimension. Um, And this is one of the talks with artist Paola Vega talking about her project. So we also had a TV, so every, every person that gives the talk has like image or not. Um, 
Um, also, the art school, the feminist school of painting, it's very open to what each collaborator wants to try with the group. Like, for example, one of the guests, the teachers, like proposed like a writing workshop instead of painting workshop. And other artists proposed to make painting, but with cleaning products instead of acrylic or tempera. Um, This an, another prop. Mm. I don't know how we are doing with time because. Yeah, I, I think um, keep going. Um, I don't know how much longer you, you have on a slideshow. I'm sure there, that there's already a few questions sort of coming in. So, okay. um, but um, yeah, just I think okay. um, keep going for a little bit and then we can open it up to questions. Thanks. For closing, I was thinking to show the last exhibition I did this horrible year. <laughs> One, it's the um, Fantasias Modulares that we present with Isabel Caso, the curator in Masmoca. Um, when you enter the place, this one was kind of the character that received you. Yeah, so the gallery is also like a sausage shape, like a very long rectangle that for me, when I visit the place, it looks like a deep theater and you can go around this long stage. And I wanted to, when we intervened the entrance with all the green triangles and then the place was divided by these curtains, like, like a stage with this landscape in the background and murals on the sides. And you don't know, I don't know if you can tell by the pictures, but we also have like a color lights marking different spots in the floor. So you feel like going in this stage, like stretch or expanded. And then another furry at the end watching this landscape. Um, and again, trying to change the white cube with all these colors in the space to give some sort of atmosphere that, for example, in this also very specific of the site and the conditions of the show because the type of project of this exhibition lasts like one year. So we were thinking, okay, what can we do that kind of looks or feels like immersive, but it can work, you know, without being activated. So I, I thought about this kind of narrative going through this stage. Um, and then geometric figures or the compositions as characters in this background of animated trees. Uh, again, it's related with all this animation like from Hanna Barbera going to Disney animism um, at the beginning, like the Queer Deco series started with this collage of fictional geometrical characters that leave this alternative universe, but also how to take the tradition of geometry and abstraction from the white cube into these whimsical spaces. Right? Um, that's why it, for me, it can work with a, a landscape as background, but also as in, in a house, in, in an interior, because domestic environments, but also landscape or nature, it's labeled as 
feminine somehow in this binary vision we have of the world. Yeah, and my goal is, is trying to break with those categories. And well, going back in, to the furies, when I start using mannequins, it was a way just to show these clothes that I was doing with the designs of my paintings, because I wanted to go through also the relationship of painting and textiles that we can find from Bauhaus to many, many other examples, but this appropriation, you know, on how an image can be where. And when I, I found, I, I could get all these head pieces of forest, I can make the mannequin like into another level. Or, um, so this one is the show at Kunsthalle Elisabon that's now in Portugal that opens in September until next month. Um, because this space is also underground and it's so wide. <laughs> when I was looking through the pictures and the plant floors, I, I took advantage of also of this wall that separates the two galleries and I asked them to make a hole. And so in my fantasy, like one of the spaces that we can see through the hole is like the, I call it the red spaceship because a lot of the works that you can see inside have image from the 70s from a program that NASA runs you know, when they ask people to ask artists to paint uh, space stations or how are we going to live you know, in these space stations according to the 70s creators. And then on this side where the ferry is, you have like all these planes or, or banks where you can see uh, see like through the windows as a screen, you know, this uh, sci-fi TV program. So one side is like a stage, you know, that you can, I was looking for a Star Trek vibe uh, with controls and yeah, like taken from the very, beginning of Star Trek, uh, like again, all these ball colors or these Jetson fantasies. And then on this side, you can see the problem. And then over there, you can see the image from NASA intervening. And then the circles, that are paintings with the faces. I call them aliens series. And then the flowers, but also the, the painting that it's on the floor, I call the controls. So sorry about the picture, but it, it has like buttons on, on screens. That's the other side of the hole. And that's like the seating area where you can have this prop. Well, now with the pandemic, you, you can't, but then the idea was to play with the helmet too. Um, so that's it for, I, I can keep going, but I don't know how. Well, that seems, yeah, that seems like a great place to sort of open it up to questions and things. And um, yeah, thank you so much. That was such an amazing talk. Um, it was so great at the beginning to see your sausage house and, uh, and where you <laughs> live and that's so inspiring. Um, and then I think also I, I love those early works, or not early, but the works you showed earlier in the talk where um, 
you know, you're looking at how a painting sort of drinks tea and <laughs> they're really kind mm. of, it's such a, uh, this, the idea of sort of these objects having such a presence and, and being a character in itself um, is amazing. Um, but yeah, I think over the talk, it's been so fascinating to see how sort of you, I, I think in way Lily sort of mentioned this already, but the kind of um, use of the way you talk about geometry as a tool for political thinking, um, whether it's the green triangle in quite a literal way or your education spaces. Um, I think that's, and then the way you kind of challenge the geometry through these kind of humorous interventions or, or dissolved edges where you break out of the frame. And I, I think that um, dialogue between the two approaches mm. is so interesting. Um, so I, I'd love to just ask you um, one question, which is about the process of making and how, for example, with your latest show installed at a tricky time um, and whether, I, I mean, I guess just, you know, do you also work with models? I'm just interested, like, do you write models? Do you, um, is it quite if you play around with that or is it digital digital or and then how do you actually install the show are you there yourself I, I'm just kind of interested to know a bit about right yeah well I I work a lot with photoshop I don't use like a studio or those other uh, 3d programs maybe I should but <laughs> I think photoshop kind of satisfies all my needs and for example with Portugal, it was very peculiar, yeah, with all the pandemic, but it was very, it was a group work, basically, mm -hmm. uh, Luis and Chao, the curators, and Alberta, all the Kunzhal Lisbon team made all the magic, because I wasn't even able to visit the place. So I was working with plant floors, pictures, and making all the sketches based on the pictures of the empty gallery. Um, maybe I, I can show you the, the sketches to give you an idea, but basically I send them instructions and they were like putting all together and we talk a lot through Skype or online, you know, to discuss. For example, I choose colors from the painting color chart. And then when the paintings got to the gallery, they were like very different in real life to what I saw in the screen. So we work a lot with that. Um, I try to use the, the things that they already have, like all the plinths on, on the bases. Um, and I think that's very important to me, like how to use local resources, not only like human resources in terms of inviting people that it's working in those in the cities where the project is, but also what the institution already have in order to make it more, yeah, to recycle. You know. mm -hmm. I think it's very important to me. And for me, that's actually the way I take advantage of things that otherwise I, I don't have the idea to make. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. So we have a question um, from Marcel, which is that um, Marcel likes the mention of fetish um, earlier in the talk. Um, and so he's wondering if, your if queer feminist fantasy pleasure and desire so sorry I'll, I'll frame this again is fe queer feminist fantasy pleasure and desire embedded into the cute animals and 70s design that you depict in your works well I think they have a lot of the narrative that we find from porn movies <laughs> from that time or to like I say, animation, like it comes from very different and opposite sides. Like it could be porn or cartoons, but I think it works on the same level of fetish for these fantastical places 
where you can do things that you cannot do in real life, you know, like go to space or being mutant or like non human. <laughs> but I think in that aspect is queer feminist in terms of breaking with the paradigm, par paradigms that we have on the daily life, right? And also to break with the categories that are applied to the bodies. Yeah. Beyond sex, I mean, it's going into rethinking identity, you know, with more freedom. I don't know if it makes sense, the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank. Hello. Hi. Um, um, I, I actually studied one of your works for my first brief uh, in Experimental 13 with Lily and Jess. And um, I, I, I just wanted to say, like, I feel that your works are so intriguing, like, in terms of, like, the graphic abstraction and the vibrant color schemes especially because like all of them have an underlying theme of like gender and queer theory. Um, I mean, it's interesting to see like the juxtaposition between masculinity and femininity um, through like the strong graphic language of these like shapes and icons. Uh, but I had a question like, uh, so I studied the work which was titled Queer Modular Panda I, uh, and I, I I love it. Like it's, I think it's so amazing, but I wanted you. to ask, is there a particular reason why you chose to go for a black and white color scheme for that work? Because like, mm. that was like something like unlike all of your like other uh, works. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. For example, in the, in the symposium, uh, one of the collaborators, uh, the artist and writer Tenshi, they were talking about how also was a prejudice to resemble colorfulness with childhood, and that also black and white could be, you know, cheerful, you know, for kids. Like, that there is not one way to relate to childhood, you know, in, in aesthetics. And then I, I always kept thinking about that because it was funny that they say that in a very colorful <laughs> installation, right? It was, it was a moment very humorous. But then going back into Queer Modular, that is a series that is inspired by Le Corbusier's Modular, you know, as a criticism to, you know, this horrible uh, size of manhood. The, the idea of the panda kind of set the black and white composition you know, as a tenderness a reference. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose- Sorry, I can't, can't hear you. Would you like to add anything to that, Shivank? Well, that's fine. No, I think. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I don't think. Hang on. No. Hang on. I think he's trying to say something. It's me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, uh, thank no, you. I was just saying like, yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, I think it's because like my, I had like another question about like, uh, but I think you answered it already. So it was like, you said you wanted to like, you know, be an architect earlier. So like, uh, yeah. <laughs> because your paintings, like, I don't know, it like has like such like an architect, strong like architectural language to them also. So I was thinking if you had any like uh, particular inspiration or something in addition to the, themes you usually observe but like um you did answer that question just now that like it's inspired from like the Corbusier's like you know so yeah 
Yeah, because when I was a kid, I, I kind of thought that architecture was the way to build this new world. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. how to rethink the way we live. And um, the thing is, is, I'm a frustrated architect because the career for me at the time it was impossible. You know, not only because you know, I have the patience, but I, I didn't have the resources. I think. Um, at the same time, I, I I know from other people that quit the career earlier that yeah I like the concept of architecture, but I, I think the way it's it, in the society like it's very limited, you know. Like yeah. I think it should be a more integrated work with different agents and not only like the ones that have the title. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. No, thank you for listening to me. Sorry. I'm, I'm thank you. No, it was an amazing oh, yeah. presentation. Like, I loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, please send, send any other questions to the um, to the chat or um or also i i don't know if you can raise your hand but if you can do <laughs> um um so i i did i wanted to sort of build on that the sort of first question frank answered asked which was um just to do with the color a bit more um and how you decide on your your color i mean it's so strong and and obviously the green triangle has a clear mm. uh, there's a clear reason for that but I, I wonder sort of across your works whether it's intuitive or whether you you are working to a certain palette that comes from a certain place I guess the 70s yeah. is the kind of key reference probably for colors but there is always something like make click like make sense with another references or for example in the last one um, in Portugal like the red Spaceship, it was the red because of Star Trek and sceneries. Um, then, like you say, Green Triangle is very direct, but I also choose sometimes like in violet or orange because orange also has political statement here in Buenos Aires or um, Yes, many times like colors have like relationships with with my own scripts. Like green also relating some characters to mutants or monsters. Purple is also another type of monster. Light blue might be more robotic, you know, but they're all these relationships that we have through cultural imaginary um, again from cartoons to toys um, i have a question here from lily james i um, asked you already uh, earlier okay <laughs> but i have another but i have another question this is this is maybe um so i've got very loud kids in the background um very uh, kind of strange question, but about um, do you, I was wondering about if you've ever exhibited any of your work outside. I mean, I think obviously you've taken over the shop and so you're kind of moving out of the white cube into a kind of commercial space. And I was wondering if you've ever worked literally outside in a, in a natural landscape or... Uh, also, because we're teaching this year about the design of natural history museums and thinking about <laughs> relationships, <laughs> relationships, different contemporary relationships to nature. And I just wondered, mm. not really explicit in your work, but I'm sure you're thinking about it. And I'd just love to hear you talk about it a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Right. Well, first of all, one of the great books I need to recommend on relationship with nature is um, this that I actually got in London when I was doing the residency there. It's 
a feminist queer creep by Alison Kaffer. Uh, I can send you the, the message here. Alison Kaffer. Um, I, it's also like a great critique on a lot of ideas from cyborg manifesto from Haraway. Um, I think it's very clever and I highly recommend it. And then the thing with open spaces, it's really a challenge for me to think without a, a room. <laughs> it's actually, uh, I was invited a couple of times to make projects that didn't work at the end, but when I try to think that something that goes outdoor, like I think of murals or like sort of monuments that kind of go very cute. <laughs> and yeah, for me, it, it's a challenge. Like I, I still have to, like a lot of rethinking on painting, you know, outside the, like the protection that the building gives to. Um, when we did the, the interventions uh, on outdoor spaces with South Bank Center, like, it was the painting on some concrete blocks that were in the street. The, the, there was the like the cover uh, image of the stage. Uh, it, it was more thinking about patterns, the kind of dress stuff, like the patterns that dress the trees, you know, like pyjamas you know, for trees. We did like in Shanghai a tank, like a sort of picnic. So again, my work was represented in the patterns of the uh, of the mantas. How you say like the picnic uh, textile that you put in the floor on the floor. So yeah, I. I I didn't have like um, like a nature intervention yet. Like I, I think that would be a great challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we should probably wrap it up there. Um, so that was such a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Ad. Um, yeah, we. I think it was so amazing to see the whole range of your projects and the one and like concluding with the one that you just has just opened and um, and also seeing your space, your home studio. Um, so it was really wonderful um, and I think it's given us lots to think about. So um, yeah, thank you so much um, and have a great well, evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh. I'll, I'll unmute everyone if I can, um, and um, we can clap, say thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hopefully, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.